Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to an exciting webinar on biosimilars and biologics insights for patients and physicians. I'm very happy on behalf of ARDA, the American Autoimmune Related Diseases Association, and the Biosimilars Forum to welcome you to our webinar today. My name is Randall Ruta, and I'm the president and CEO of the Art of Auto American, American Autoimmune Related Diseases Association, otherwise known as ARDA. And ARDA for nearly 30 years has been an advocate and a champion supporting people with autoimmune diseases across all categories of conditions, trying to foster information, facilitate collaboration through education, public awareness, advocacy, and research. Many of you on the call have an autoimmune disease or have a family member with an autoimmune condition or maybe multiple conditions, and we're very excited to have you participate in this webinar today. One in five people you meet may have an autoimmune disease or may develop one later in life. Some 50 million Americans have an autoimmune disease. And that includes more than 100, we're thinking 130 or so, diseases that are specifically diagnosed as autoimmune conditions. And about 75% of autoimmune diseases occur in women. So it's very much a women's health issue as well as an issue for men and families generally. Our agenda today is outstanding. We've pulled together amazing experts in the area of biologics and biosimilars, and I'm so excited that you can hear from them today. I'm being joined by Julie Reed, a longtime colleague and president of the Biosimilars Forum, and I'll be introducing her in just a moment. She will be introducing three expert colleagues from the FDA uh, that'll talk about biosimilar and interchangeable biologic products and the biosimilar development and the potential that is there for all patients who are experiencing an autoimmune disease, cancer, or other conditions where biologics and now biosimilars can make such a life-changing difference for them. We will be joined by Dr. Jonathan Kay from UMass. And he is expert in this area, both as a researcher, a, a clinician who constantly um, counsels patients and understands and investigates the value of biosimilars in their lives. And he'll share with us the conversations he has with patients as he counsels them on seeking the best treatment uh, increasingly through biosimilars. And then we'll break for questions and answers. And many of you who have registered submitted your questions and comments and we'll bring those forward as we um, uh, have these expert panelists available to us and can then ask the questions that you put forward. So I'm very excited to get started and invite Julie Reed to tell us a little bit about herself in the Biosimilars Forum. Julie? Thanks, Randy, and, and thank you all for being here this afternoon. Um, as Randy said, I'm Julie Reed. I'm the president of the Biosimilars Forum. And I'm very excited to be co-sponsoring this event with the American Autoimmune Related Diseases Association. Special thanks to everyone uh, for tuning in today. As we have, as Randy said, many experts and bright minds joining us for this discussion. I want to take a couple minutes just to introduce the Biosimilars Forum and tell you why we believe in the promise of biosimilars for patients and how they, the biosimilars, are, necessar are a necessary part of the solution in this country to lower health care costs. The Biosimilars Forum is a nonprofit organization whose members represent the majority of companies with the most significant U.S. biosimilars development portfolio. We're the ones who are actually developing biosimilars for all of you. Every day for the past 10 years, the members of the Biosimilars Forum have been working to bring lower cost biosimilars to patients and the healthcare system at large. An important part of our work at the forum and as members of the healthcare community is making sure that patients and providers are aware of the many benefits biosimilars will provide. That's why we're here today. To support this next generation of lower cost medicines and increase the use of lower cost biosimilars involves educating patients and physicians and building trust between them to select the right treatment option. Many of you may already be familiar with biologic therapies. 
some of you on this call may even be using biologic medicines right now. Biosimilars are lower cost alternatives to biologic brand medicines and create new choices in the biologics marketplace for those battling ch your challenging diseases like cancers, Crohn's, and rheumatoid arthritis. Not only do they provide more treatment options for patients like you, we believe that increasing access and the use of biosimilars is a key pillar to unlocking much needed savings for patients and taxpayers. You should know that biosimilars are approved by the US FDA. They will be just as safe and effective as their corresponding originator product. The FDA approves biosimilars only after we meet the stringent and rigorous standards for approval, including that a biosimilar have no clinical meaningful differences in the safety profile, potency, and purity compared to originator biosimilars. Now, biosimilars are more than just life-saving therapies. They have the potential to significantly lower healthcare costs. We know that with increased access to biosimilar medications, biosimilars could save the U.S. healthcare system as much as $250 billion over the next 10 years. So it's quite an honor for me as the president of the Biosimilars Forum and our members to join AARBA and our colleagues and all of you today to talk more about biosimilars. I wanna take this time to introduce our partners and colleagues at the FDA. We're quite honored to have you here and thank you for doing this with all of us. Today, Dr. Sarah Yim, the Director of the Office of Therapeutics and Biologics and Biosimilars, will kick us off from the FDA. Following Dr. Yim will be Dr. Emanuela Lacana, who is also the Deputy Director of the Biosimilars Office and from the FDA. And then following Dr. Lacana will be Sarah Eikenberry, who is in charge of communications for the Biosimilars program at the FDA. So let me turn it over to Dr. Yim. And again, thank you, Sarah, for being here today. Well, thank you, uh, Julie. We really appreciate the opportunity to give you um, and this audience a brief introduction today to the regulatory and scientific concepts relating to biosimilar and interchangeable biologic products in the United States. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide uh, summarizes the current status of biosimilars in the U.S. As shown in the table on the right, there are 28 approved biosimilars to nine original brand reference products in the U.S. 17 of these are marketed, with the most options being the five marketed biosimilars to Herceptin, also known as trastuzumab. Although half of the approvals um, were for drugs that had um, autoimmune disease-related conditions approved, and that is biosimilars to Humira, Remicade, Enbrel, and Rituxan, only the two approved biosimilars to Rituxan and two out of the four approved biosimilars to Remicade are on the market. So there is still relatively limited competition in the marketplace from biosimilars, and especially from biosimilars to autoimmune-related biologics. The table on the left lists out the approved biosimilars by name, by year of approval, and marketing status, and the asterisks mark the ones for which an advisory committee meeting was held. Um, and you can access those via the FDA website. Generally, uh, these advisory committee meetings were held for the first uh, biosimilars to a reference product. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Now, I realize I've been using some regulatory terms, so I wanted to step back and tell you about them because the Biologics Price Competition and Innovation Act, or BPCI Act, which created the legal framework for biosimilars, 
assigns very specific definitions and standards for them that are the marching orders FDA follows when regulating these products. So first, a reference product is the single biological product already approved by the FDA against which a proposed biosimilar product is compared. In other words, the original brand biologic. A biosimilar is defined as a biological product that is highly similar to and has no clinically meaningful differences from an F existing FDA approved reference product. So FDA has to determine a biosimilar meets this standard in order to approve it. An interchangeable product is a biosimilar, so it has to meet the same standards as other biosimilars. But there are also two additional standards um, that are related to the potential for substitution. One, the expectation that it can produce the same clinical result as the reference product in any given patient, which, to be honest, I'm not sure is any different than no clinically meaningful differences. And two, that switching between the proposed product and the reference product does not increase safety risks or decrease effectiveness compared to using the reference product without switching. Next slide, please. So if determined to meet the definition outlined in the BPCI Act, an interchangeable biosimilar product may be substituted for the reference product without the intervention of the healthcare provider who prescribed the reference product um, subject to state laws. There are no interchangeable products yet available in the U.S. The additional information expected in an interchangeable application is intended to help inform what might happen with substitution at the pharmacy level. <clears throat> and that is such as what happens with generic drugs where patients could potentially get you know, a different generic depending on, you know, the occasion or the pharmacy, whatever's available. An interchangeability designation must be requested in an application and does not indicate a higher level of biosimilarity. An example of data they use to support um, an application for interchangeability is a switching study, which is diagrammed here and this is where one group stays on the reference product uh, and the other group switches between the reference product and proposed interchangeable product. Pharmacokinetic sampling, efficacy, and safety parameters would be evaluated in this kind of study. But the particular data needed for a given interchangeability application really would depend on product and context-specific factors such as the level of safety concern about anti-product immune responses. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so I mentioned that um, interchangeability is kind of like the generic drug scenario. And the question is, why is the concern potentially different for generic drugs rel relative to biologics? And this goes back to some fundamental differences between chemically-based drugs and biologics, which are larger, more complex, and heterogeneous products. So I want to talk about that for a minute. So first, let's think about what's in a dose of a typical small molecule drug. On a molecular level, you're typically not talking about a lot of variety. And I'm using Viagra here as an example because I found a nice picture of Viagra and its generic side by side. If you were able to see into either pill using molecular eyeglasses, you would see that the sil a sildenafil molecule is a sildenafil molecule. The lack of variety here means that for a brand or a generic, either product is based off of identical molecules. The things that could be different are more about the wrappings. So, in other words, the things in the product that may have an effect that could cause a difference in exposure. Um, and here I'm using a, um, jelly beans as an analogy. So here, um, sildenafil would be a single yellow jelly bean, a sildenafil molecule. And um, really what's different in the generic versus the brand would be 
the wrapping. Slide six. Uh, next slide, please. So why does it work this way for biologics? Why do we have to call them biosimilars and make it sound like somehow they fail to be the same? Well, the problem is not because of the copier, but the thing to be copied. So let's talk about what we're trying to copy. Next slide, please. Biologics, as I mentioned, are typically um, made from or contain large protein molecules. These proteins are made in cells from a genetic template, but after the protein is made, other add-ons and changes to the protein happen inside the cell that aren't from a template, and so they're not as well controlled. The end result is that an average biologic reference product will be a mix of many slightly different versions of that protein in each dose or batch. So a biosimilar can start off with an identical genetic genetic template is the reference product and produce an identical basic protein molecule, but then uh, must account for the variety that happens after that. So going back to the jelly bean analogy, a biosimilar's job is not just to match one of the jelly beans, but also to match the pattern of jelly beans in the jar. And because the mix in the reference product is slightly different each time, the biosimilars are trying to match the varieties not just at one time, but the range of varieties that's observed in the reference products jars. So biosimilar sponsors study many lots of the reference products over time and put together a production process that can follow those patterns and variants in a way that is highly similar. But this is the reason why they're called biosimilar and not biosame or bioidentical or even generic. For most biologics, each time you receive a dose, that dose is slightly different from the previous dose because it contains a slightly different mix of variants. So the reference product isn't identical to itself dose to dose or batch to batch. There isn't just one thing to be copied, so the concept of being identical is not even an option. Next slide, please. So the answer to the question of why can't a biologic be copied exactly is that most biologics are a mix of versions of a molecule and what's in the product is never exactly the same. But this is the expected state for a biologic. So this heterogeneity is monitored and production processes are adjusted if needed to keep the variety within a certain range. These are things that both the reference product and their biosimilars would do. And of course, there's an exception to everything. I should mention that there are smaller proteins that are produced in just one version and can be copied exactly, but they're more the exception than the rule. So I won't go into them here. Next slide, please. So the key takeaways. Um, <clears throat> As you'll hear from Dr. Lacana um, in a little bit, um, comparative analytical data are the foundation of a biosimilarity assessment because understanding the pattern of the varieties in each product allows us to de determine whether they should function similarly. Biologic products are often a mix of molecular variants that are slightly different in each dose or batch. And a biosimilar can be shown to be highly similar to its reference product through this extensive comparative analytical data on the pattern of the variance and the impact of the variance on structure and function. For approval, FDA must determine that a biosimilar has met the highly similar standard and that the biosimilar has no clinically meaningful differences from its reference product. The clinical studies in a development program for biosimilars are used to provide supportive information and not to reprove efficacy and safety. All these things are scrutinized very carefully during FDA review, and approval means that patients and their healthcare providers can be confident in the safety and effectiveness of a biosimilar. Next slide, please. 
Interchangeable biological products are also biosimilars, and they're not yet available in the United States. By definition, interchangeable products are intended to be pharmacy substitutable without intervention of the prescribing healthcare provider, as is the case with small molecule generics, um, but subject to state laws. Interchangeable designation does not indicate a higher standard of biosimilarity, but rather incorporates different statutory criteria that reflect scientific considerations related to the potential for substitution without the prescriber's knowledge. So patients and healthcare providers do not need to wait uh, for a biosimilar to become an interchangeable product. In fact, a company may not even seek licensure for interchangeability, for example, if its product is one that's administered in a setting where the prescriber is likely to be present, such as an infusion center or hospital. Um, and that, that brings me to the end of my uh, part. Thanks for your attention. Now I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Lakana, who will tell you more about the biosimilar regulatory review process and go through a brief case study. Good afternoon. I would also like to share my appreciation and thank the organizer for the opportunity to speak today. Um, if you could please go to the next slide. Um, in my presentation, I will discuss the approval of Inflectra, or CTP-13, the company code name for Inflectra, the first biosimilar to Remicade. Most of the case study slides I will show were presented at the advisory committee meeting held before Inflectra was approved. Before delving into the actual case study, I want to provide a brief regulatory background and description of the molecule. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a licensure pathway that permits a biosimilar biological product to be licensed yeah. under 351K of the Public Health Service Act based on less than a full complement of product-specific preclinical and clinical data is an abbreviated licensure pathway. What is abbreviated about a biosimilar application and what is a rationale for that? If you're familiar with drug development for a new product represented by the square on the left, often very little is known about it. So a sponsor has to provide all the important information and do all the studies to find the right dose and show whether it works in a particular disease or condition. This typically includes the full complement of data, analytical data for full molecular characterization, as well as formulation and manufacturing information, non-clinical data to support the safety of use in humans, and a lot of clinical data, pharmacokinetic and or pharmacodynamic data, as well as multiple clinical trials, including the phase three trial that definitively established the safety and efficacy of the product for each disease or condition the sponsor is seeking approval for. Contrast this with an abbreviated um, application for a biosimilar product represented by the pyramid on the right. The main emphasis is the comparison of the biosimilar with its reference product. The analytical comparison is the foundation of the biosimilar pathway. What enables us to avoid repeating the entire development program of the reference product is data that shows that two products are highly similar from a molecular standpoint. Uh, next slide, please. So what does the sponsor need to do to gain approval uh, for a biosimilar product? The sponsor will need to provide data and information demonstrating that the biosimilar product is highly similar to the reference product and that there are no clinically meaningful differences between the biosimilar and the reference product. In the next few slides, I will provide examples of what that means in practical ter terms. Next slide, please. So uh, now for some basic information on the molecule. Uh, Remicade is a monoclonal antibody that binds a molecule called TNF-alpha, which is a critical 
factor in promoting inflammation in several autoimmune diseases. Antibodies are composed of two heavy chain depicted by the elongated um, green ovals and two light chains depicted by the shorter ovals. Antibodies have complex structural features that generally have two main functions. One is binding a specific molecule, in this case TNS-alpha, while the other is binding to cell of the immune system. Uh, once the antibody binds, these immune system cells kill those cells that cause inflammation. There are a variety of tests that can be used to understand and measure these functions. Uh, next slide, please. Now we will describe the first part of biosimilarity, highly similar with no clinically meaningful differences. This table summarizes all the tests that were used to directly compare Remicade and Inflectra. As you can see, multiple methods were used to evaluate the various characteristics of the molecule. For example, their sequence, purity, and bioactivity. The results of all these tests taken together allowed FDA to <clears throat> make a determination <coughs> make a determination that Inflectra is highly similar to Remicade. I will discuss these results in more details, but because this is a large amount of data, in the next slides I will focus on the tests in the red boxes that evaluate some of the biological activity of the molecules. Next slide, please. In this slide, I am showing the results of tests the measure the ability of CTP13 and Remicade to bind to TNF-alpha, represented in the top plot, and the ability to block TNF-alpha activity, represented in the bottom plot. These activities are the way in which Remicade works to treat autoimmune diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis. Each dot in this plot represents one lot of product. Using the jelly bean analogy, this would be a container of multicolored jelly beans from which multiple jars or doses of multicolored jelly beans are taken. We ask by a similar sponsor to test multiple lots of the reference product and of their product so that we can understand the composition of each jelly bean container. As you can see, the biosimilar product lots have distributions that is very similar to the reference product, Remicade, as well as to European source and Fliximab. These data were analyzed <coughs> using a statistical test depicted in the left side of the slide. If the horizontal bar falls within the two vertical bars, the lots are considered equivalent. These tests show that CTP13 has the same TNS-alpha binding and TNS-alpha blocking activity as Remicade. Next slide, please. This slide shows a different type of biological activity. In the antibody consume, I showed you a pattern molecule that binds to immune cells and activates them to kill inflammatory cells. The tests in this slide measure dysfunction called antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, or ADCC. CTP13, Remicade, or European-sourced infliximab were evaluated for their capability to activate and induce the killing activity of either a mixture of immune blood cells on the left or a selected population of immune cells on the right. The method used for data analysis, called quality ranges, provides that the lots should fall within the red horizontal bars. As you can see, for the test conducted using immune blood cells, all the results fall within the red bars. For the test on the right, 92% of the test results for CTP13 fall within the red bars. This can happen when using different tests to 
measure the same function. Regardless, this finding heightened FDA scrutiny and the agency work with the sponsor to establish specific controls to ensure that all future lots would fall within the red bars. Based on the results of this test, I showed you and numerous other tests that were used to compare Remicade and CTP-13, the FDA made a determination <clears throat> that CTP-13 met the highly similar requirement. Now I will discuss the data used to establish neoclinically meaningful differences. Next slide, please. In study 1.4, Healthy volunteers were administered a dose of CTP-13 and of U.S. or EU Remicade. Blood samples were taken at different times to measure the level of the drugs in the blood. The results of this study are summarized in this plot. As you can see, the blood levels of the drug are similar among CTP-13, US, and EU Remicade for the entire duration of the study. Uh, the inserted graph on the top is an enlarged profile of the first two days of the study. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, study 3.1 was a comparative clinical study in 606 patients with active rheumatoid arthritis. The main result that determined whether the medicine worked was the ACR20 response at week 30. ACR20 means that there, are, there is at least 20% improvement in the tender and swollen joint counts, in addition to at least 20% improvement in three of the four measures of disease signs or symptoms. Mm. Here we display the primary efficacy results from study 3.1. Among patients, 61% of patients on CTP-13 were ACR20 responders at week 30, as compared to 59% on Remicade. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the overall occurrence of adverse events, serious adverse events, and adverse events leading to discontinuation of the drug were similar between CTP-13 and the comparable products. Here are two examples. Events that causes patients to interrupt the treatment were 11% in CTP-13 and 16% in Remicade while serious adverse events were 14% in CTP-13 and 10% in Remicade. These numbers are estimates only, and there was no consistent pattern that would suggest a safety difference between the two products. In addition, immune responses against the product can sometimes be associated <coughs> with changes in exposure or allergic reactions, so anti-drug antibodies were measured in these studies. As you can see, the anti-drug antibodies were generated in the same proportion in patients treated with CTP-13 or with Remicade. Based on the totality of the data from the clinical studies, including the pharmacokinetic efficacy and safety data, FDA determined that there were no clinically meaningful differences between CTP-13 and Remicade. Uh, next slide, please. As I described in the previous slides, the clinical data were collected in healthy volunteers and uh, rheumatoid arthritis patients. CTP-13 was not tested in all indications for which K was approved. In this slide, I will provide the reasons why Inflectra should work in the indications that were not directly studied. I will, uh, excuse me, First, the underlying protein made from the genetic template is the same. The structure and functions of the two antibodies are highly similar in extensive analytical testing. All the approved use of Remicade use TNF alpha binding as a major or primary mechanism, <clears throat> including rheumatoid arthritis. The analytical tests showed that TNF-alpha binding was highly similar between the two products, 
and the clinical data in rheumatoid arthritis patients was consistent with that. However, as was discussed at the advisory committee meeting for CT Peters team, in inflammatory bowel diseases, it is likely that in addition to TNF alpha binding, other mechanisms also play a role. While these other mechanisms are not thought to apply to rheumatoid arthritis, there is no scientific reason to expect there would be a difference in the other mechanisms based on the totality of the information. That is, Inflectra and Remicade have identical underlying proteins. Multiple analytical tests show highly similar structure and function, with analytical tests for the major primary mechanism of action being verified by clinical study data showing no clinically meaningful differences. The data to support using IBD was therefore strong, and this has been borne out in clinical data now available for this indication. Uh, next slide, please. Inflectra was brought for discussion to the Arthritis Advisory Committee, and gastroenterologists were a joint member of the committee. All aspects of CT Peter team application were discussed. And ultimately, the committee voted 21 to 3 to approve Inflectra for all the indications for which Remicade was approved. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, since approval, extensive clinical data in IBD patients have been published from randomized trials and observational studies in thousands of patients. These data are consistent in showing that there are no differences in clinical safety, efficacy, or immunogenicity and that there are no differences after patients are switched to a biosimilar. And with this, I end my presentation. Next, Sarah Eikenberry, our senior communication advisor, will share you with you at the educational resources. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Manu. I'm happy to be here to just share briefly the resources that SDA has um, about biosimilar interchangeable products. Next slide, please. And the next one. Thank you. Um, we have a variety of education resources to help provide unbiased information about biosimilar and interchangeable products to both healthcare providers, patients, and other stakeholders. But what I want to draw your attention to on this slide is that stakeholder engagement is an extremely part of, uh, important part of our education efforts. And we um, really enjoy providing presentations like this one um, and also participating in other activities um, with various stakeholder groups. And we are very willing to do so because that's how we help um, people understand what biosimilar interchangeable products are. And you can see here on this slide about healthcare provider materials that we have um, an infographic, we have web content, and various fact sheets available on our website for download and, and for use. Next slide, please. And this is um, a sample of our patient materials. We have an infographic and a website currently that has information for patients um, that addresses topics and concerns that we've found to be most important to patients through some of the testing and research that we've done here at FDA. Next slide. Um, our future plans are that we are working on developing additional materials and for patients and healthcare providers. In addition to, um, we've kicked off a new project to work on teaching um, an educational curriculum for medical nursing and pharmacy schools and we're currently testing additional patient materials with um, patients throughout the United States. Next slide, please. And so here's our resources, and I'll, um, you know, you can find any of the stuff that we're talking about here today at our site, fda.gov slash biosimilars. Um, we have the Purple Book Search site, which is our database of licensed biological products. That's a relatively new um, database that FDA has that has compiled all of the FDA licensed biological products on one um, site and there's a nice simple search and then there's an advanced search so it meets a variety of stakeholder needs when looking for information about biological products. 
Um, you can also go to Drugs at FDA if you want to read the product labeling and review information. And as Manu went through some of the um, materials, uh, some of that was also from our advisory committee meetings that we have for some of the products, and so you can really do a deep dive on those materials if you're interested. And finally, I'll just sum us up with our last slide um, that the, the promise of biosimilars is really more treatment options for patient and getting access to life-saving drugs. And the way that that's being done is through market competition. And we um, you know, just want everyone to feel comfortable with FDA-approved biosimilar products because they're safe and effective. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jonathan Kay for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here and to be talking to you about biosimilars in clinical practice. I'd like to start, uh, next slide please. I engage with my patients regardless of their underlying diagnosis by trying to understand their unique experience and how their condition impacts their daily life. I ask questions about activities of daily living and how their condition impacts their ability to perform these activities, as well as questions about pain and other symptoms. Based upon understanding the patient's diagnosis, I work with them to design a customized plan of care to optimize health and well-being, and we explore together the available treatment options. Next slide, please. Biologics have revolutionized the therapeutic landscape for patients with autoimmune diseases and for their healthcare providers. The availability of biosimilars now makes these effective treatments more affordable when a biosimilar exists for a given reference product. The FDA has carefully reviewed and assessed biosimilar candidates, and those that are FDA approved have been compared extensively to their reference products in many ways as has been shown, and equivalent efficacy and comparable safety have been demonstrated. Thus, an FDA-approved biosimilar can be considered to be like another batch of the reference product. There is variability over time in all biologics. The Remicade that was produced in the late 1990s and the Remicade that is produced today are not identical to one another because they're produced by cells, and there's variability in the products of these living organisms. The biosimilar has been developed in comparison to commercially available batches of the reference product, and has been engineered and then compared in clinical studies and analytical studies, and shown to be highly similar without clinically meaningful differences. So when your provider prescribes a biosimilar or a reference product, you can be assured that if the FDA has approved either of these, they are reliable and effective therapies. Next slide, please. As Dr. Yim mentioned, there are 28 biosimilars that are currently approved by the United States Food and Drug Administration, but only 17 of these are currently marketed. Part of the reason for that is that patent litigation has prevented the availability of adalimumab and atanercept biosimilars, biosimilars for Humira and Enbrel, to be marketed in the United States, whereas these are marketed in Europe and other countries uh, and have been used successfully by patients in those countries. Over 50 biosimilars are currently in development for these and other biologic therapies. The autoimmune conditions for which biosimilars are currently being used as treatment include rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, psoriasis, spondyloarthritis, ankylosing spondylitis being the prototypical example, uh, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis. Other biosimilars have been approved and marketed for the treatment of cancers, bevacizumab and trastuzumab biosimilars, as well as filgrastim and pegfilgrastim to increase white blood cells in patients receiving chemotherapy, 
and then an erythropoietin biosimilar that is used to treat anemia in patients with chronic kidney disease and other conditions where anemia occurs. Next slide, please. A patient may be recommended a biosimilar to treat their disease when they're starting on a biologic agent for the first time, in which case, if the biosimilar is more cost-effective, a biosimilar may be recommended rather than the reference product. If a patient has been treated with a medication and that medication is no longer as effective, they may be changed to a biosimilar of another product rather than the reference product, again, if that biosimilar is more cost effective. Finally, a situation that often is encountered is that because biosimilars are oftentimes less expensive than the reference product, an insurance plan may require that the patient receive the biosimilar instead of the reference product to achieve cost savings. This transition from the reference product to the biosimilar is similar to transitioning from one lot of the reference product to another, although the biosimilar is produced by a different manufacturer. Next slide, please. Biosimilars provide economic benefits to patients and to the healthcare system. They provide a less costly approach to comparable treatment, and the experience in Europe has been positive and holds promise for the United States. Use of a lower cost biosimilar benefits others with your condition by allowing more people to be treated with an effective medication. Taking into account rebates and discounts to pharmacy benefit managers, the annual cost of Humira in 2018 was about $38,000 a year. In the United Kingdom, an Adalimumab biosimilar, a biosimilar of that reference product, costs about 3,000 United States dollars per year for a patient. Thus, one could treat only six to eight patients with Humira in the United States for the amount that it costs to treat 100 patients with adalimumab biosimilar in the United Kingdom. The savings realized by using biosimilars may be redirected to pay for novel therapies that address unmet needs. So not only can more patients be treated with effective biological therapies when biosimilars save financial resources in the healthcare system, but these resources may be redirected to pay for novel treatments that address unmet needs for other diseases. Next slide, please. This slide depicts the healthcare triangle in the United States payment system. There are three stakeholders in healthcare, the patient, the provider, and the payer. The patient consumes a medication but neither chooses nor pays the full cost of the medication in most cases. The provider chooses the medication and writes the prescription, but neither consumes the medication nor pays for the medication. The payer, the insurance provider, pays for the medication, but neither has the ability to choose the medication nor consumes the medication. So how does the payer regulate the expenditure of their dollars for effective treatment of insured individuals. The payer may initiate a prior authorization process whereby the provider has to provide a certain amount of information to justify prescribing the medication that they chose to prescribe for the patient. This requires additional work on the part of the provider or the provider's office and slows down the process whereby patients can use effective medications. In order to transfer some of the financial burden that the payer experiences to the patient, the payer may require a co-payment, a smaller portion of the cost of the medication, which the patient must foot uh, in order to receive the medication. So how could one incentivize the use of biosimilars, which are less expensive in most cases than the reference product, and which will reduce the overall expenditure of healthcare dollars. The payer should 
share some of the financial cost savings with the patient, either by waiving the copayment or significantly reducing the copayment required of the patient. For the provider to incentivize prescription of biosimilars, the payer should waive prior authorization. And thus, if a provider wants to prescribe a certain biopharmaceutical, the biosimilar is available, the provider might prescribe the biosimilar without having to go through the paperwork required of prior authorization. Whereas if the provider wanted to prescribe the brand name drug, they would still have to go through the prior authorization process. Patients still have free choice. If a patient does not wish to receive a biosimilar, the patient is not prevented from receiving the reference product. However, the patient may have to foot the entire cost of the reference product, which can be upwards of $50,000 a year for a medication such as Humira. Next slide, please. Advantages of lower cost biosimilars to the payer. Greater competition in the marketplace should result in price reductions and direct savings. And this has occurred with infliximab Remicade. Initially during the first two quarters of the year in which the biosimilar inflector was introduced, the cost of 100 milligrams of inflector was about $200 more than the cost of 100 milligrams of Remicade. However, subsequently, the average sales price of the biosimilar decreased to below that of the reference product. And now, with the availability of two infliximab biosimilars, the price of reference product, Remicade, has decreased by about 50% from 2017, and the price of the two biosimilars are even lower than the price of Remicade. As I mentioned earlier, spending could be redirected toward expanded patient access, either to more patients receiving the same molecule or to other patients receiving other medications, innovative treatments to address unmet needs. For providers, the availability of lower cost biosimilars facilitates the choice of the most appropriate treatment for the patient. This has the potential to improve treatment outcomes. And for the patient, Medications for optimal treatment should become more accessible because the financial barrier should be lessened. But most importantly, patients should share in the financial savings acquired by the insurance provider with the use of a biosimilar. Next slide. In summary, an FDA approved biosimilar is like another batch of its reference product and can be used by a patient with the same confidence that the patient uses the reference product. Transitioning from bioriginators reference products to their biosimilars does not result in significant loss of effectiveness or increased occurrence of adverse events or development of anti-drug antibodies, so-called immunogenicity. The availability of biosimilars has introduced market competition that has driven down the cost of biopharmaceuticals for which there are biosimilars. In Norway, where there's a single payer system, the price of infliximab was 69% lower than that of the reference product with the introduction of the biosimilar. In Sweden, another system where there's a bidding process and the national health insurance, uh, AbbVie, came in with a bid for Humira that was 80% lower than their previous price and came in lower than that of the Adalimumab biosimilars. Thus, for the subsequent year, patients receiving Adalimumab in Sweden received Humira, but that Humira was significantly less expensive to the government than it had been previously. So whether the biosimilar is less expensive or the reference product is less expensive. Either way, patients receive the optimal therapy and effective treatment for their underlying diseases. Savings realized by using biosimilars may be redirected to pay for novel therapies that address unmet needs, providing yet another advantage for biosimilars. Thank you. Closing advice uh, for patient physicians, 
actively consider biosimilars as comparable cost beneficial and effective treatments. Rely upon the Food and Drug Administration for expert evaluation and guidance regarding biologics and biosimilars. Choose biosimilars for individualized treatment plans when appropriate and recognize that savings realized by using biosimilars should support innovation and greater access and should benefit individual patients. So thank you, Dr. K. This is Randy Ruta with ARDA, and we really appreciate your remarks and those of our expert colleagues from the FDA, Dr. Kim, Dr. Lakana, Ms. Eikenberry. I mean, all of you really brought forth critical information that those participants in this call, so many of whom uh, have an autoimmune disease and are trying to be an active part of their health care, talking to their physicians, doing their homework, understanding the medications that are best for them. This is critical. Uh, a lot of the information you presented felt technical, and yet I know that you did a really thoughtful job in trying to speak directly to those patients and to those physicians that are also participating on this call. You know, for ARDA as a patient advocate, um, as a, a group that's promoting public awareness, uh, helping educate and support patients, uh, promoting policies and practices within the healthcare ecosystem that support access and affordability, uh, adherence uh, for medications, including innovative med medications like biologics and biosimilars. Um, this is such a critical conversation. And the issue of cost savings, both for the individual patient as well as to the system, is huge. Um, now, it wouldn't surprise you as I think about the uh, questions that were submitted by those people on the call, that many of those questions were very fundamental. I have an autoimmune disease, and really all of the various diseases were mentioned by different um, of those participants, and they just wanted to know, are there options for me? How should I think about the medications that I'm taking? So not surprisingly, so much of what you shared really touched on that. Um, I do have some questions uh, that kind of are reflective, either specifically or uh, kind of batches of questions that were offered up. And if you'd like um, and, um, and are willing, I would go ahead and share those questions with you and invite um, each of you to uh, kind of, in quote, step forward and help us understand for that questioner um, what an appropriate response might be. Now, not surprisingly, we're in the middle of a pandemic, certainly for people with autoimmune disease, underlying conditions. Um, they're very, very concerned about the interplay between the medications they're taking and COVID-19. So let me start with that because uh, with the exception of those questions relating to just basic information, is there a medication available to me with my particular condition? The next most prevalent question was, does taking a biologic or biosimilar affect my risk of contracting COVID-19 or your experience more likely in, uh, should you um, have COVID-19? So could, could those of you, our, our expert speakers, just address that? What is that, that relationship or is there any between um, a biosimilar, being on a biosimilar and um, being at risk of COVID-19 or if you've actually um, become infected, what that might mean for you? Who would like to take a, a shot at that? Maybe one of our FDA colleagues or Dr. K? I'll take it. Uh, there has not been an increased occurrence of COVID-19 among patients with rheumatoid arthritis or other rheumatological diseases who are taking biologic agents compared to other individuals. The coronavirus is so contagious and has the potential to infect anybody uh, that being on a biologic does not necessarily increase your risk of contracting coronavirus any more than being exposed to it without observing appropriate protective measures. I would encourage everyone to listen to Dr. Fauci to wear a mask, to socially distance, to avoid large groups of people, to wash your hands, 20 seconds warm soap and water, use uh, hand sanitizers. If you're on a biologic agent and are exposed to coronavirus, you should stop your biologic agent just to minimize or to reduce your risk of having a more severe infection. But the disease is so prevalent and so infectious that 
being on a biologic or a biosimilar does not necessarily put you at greater risk than your already significant risk of, of contracting COVID-19 if you don't take appropriate precautions. I really appreciate that. I know we counsel people with autoimmune disease, those that have come to some of our other programs through ARDA and our partner groups about COVID-19, the risks associated with it, the precautions to take. And um, as you suggest, you know, it's that conversation with their physician to understand exactly what needs to occur. And it's good to know kind of what it is you're sharing with your patients, uh, Dr. K, as they ask you about COVID-19, whether they're taking a biosimilar or a biologic or not, it's a top of mind concern as you might imagine. Um, there's a, a related question, I guess, and I would maybe put that out to our colleagues at the FDA and maybe you as well, Dr. K. Um, do biologics and biosimilars have side effects? Can you comment um, on I that? Just, there I am. I'll, I'll make a comment and then um, we, uh, pass it over to Dr. K. Um, every medicine has side effects. So it, it, that particular um, question is no different for a small molecule than it is for a, a biologic. One of the nice things about biologics are that they are, you're able to target things more specifically um, oftentimes than, than small molecules that are more general. So um, in my experience of seeing a lot of data for biologics, uh, and, and this includes data for biosimilars, um, basically it just depends on what the, what the molecule is targeting. Um, but but uh, Dr. K, do you wanna sure, yeah. add anything? My response would be similar to yours. All medications have potential side effects. A biosimilar does not necessarily have different side effects from the reference product. So if the reference product has a known side effect, the biosimilar is very likely to have that same side effect and vice versa. Injection site reactions for self-administered, subcutaneously administered medications may be different between a biosimilar and the reference product if they're due to the buffer in which the protein is diluted. Uh, so a biosimilar may have less in the way of burning at the site of injection if, for example, it uses a citrate-free buffer. Uh, so not all side effects are identical, but typically biosimilars and their reference products have the same side effect profile. That's really helpful. Um, here's a question that's not quite related, um, but I think it, it is also one that came up several times. Um, and there may, and I'm going to add to it a little bit for you as I ask the question. Do biosimilars contain fillers or extra ingredients that could trigger a reaction for me? So that was the question. And then I'm wondering if in answering that question, you might also go back to that um, conversation I think that you, Dr. Yim, pointed out um, that with any biologic, um, as well as then those biosimilars, you may have a batch-to-batch -batch variation. As I know for people with autoimmune disease, so many who it's taken a long time for them to get to just that right uh, medicine or mix of medicines, um, they're just so concerned about, you know, having, um, having a reaction to something that may even not be that active ingredient. So do, they, do biosimilars contain fillers or extra ingredients um, that could trigger a reaction? And then would that relate to, or is that in addition to what might occur with just batch to batch variation? Dr. Yim? Um, or? Okay, so yeah, hi. <laughs> okay, um, I thought so. I'll start. Okay. Um, so a lot of biosimilars have the same formulation as the reference product, and you wouldn't expect um, them to have any different impact of the formulation. Um, however, there are some drugs for which the reference product has, you know, patented something or, or another, and then the biosimilar might have to have a slight difference. Um, the ingredients in a product are listed in section 11 of the label. So, and that's the prescribing information. So, 
people can go and look up the label and find out generally what ingredients there are in the product. What was the rest of the question? I apologize. No, it was just was really about the ingredients and then also just that batch to batch variation, which, you know, is going to occur with any kind of, um, you know, biologic or living process that creates then that medicine. Dr. K, did you have anything to add to that? No, that that's a full answer to the question. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, and I'll, uh, we are also getting questions coming in live from our chats. Here's one um, concerning uh, rituximab, and that uh, is asking um, about whether that might affect fertility and also uh, hair loss. Do you have any understanding of that? Maybe Dr. K or Julie? I, would I will let Dr. K answer that. <laughs> or do we need to, or, or is that something I can follow up with with this particular um, uh, submitted question? <clears throat> I, I've not heard of rituximab causing total hair loss. Uh, okay. If it's effect on fertility, it's not been studied necessarily in pregnant women. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, Let's look to another question uh, here. Uh, someone who's a psoriasis patient is just saying, who can I talk to about getting on a biosimilar? Uh, they, they suggested that their pharmacist, their doctor, my insurance company, what's the best route for them to take um, as they're exploring, um, either starting for the first time as the, after a diagnosis or maybe um, being proposed with a switch? Um, who should they talk to about getting on a biosimilar? Patients should talk to their healthcare provider uh, the individual that's prescribing the medication, the biologic therapy that they're receiving. Uh, right now, the only biosimilars for autoimmune diseases would be infliximab and rituximab. So if you're taking Humira or Enbrel, a biosimilar would not be available for that product in the United States uh, for Humira until 2023 and for Enbrel until 2028. Uh, so if you're receiving Remicade or Rituximab, and you're interested in changing to a biosimilar, uh, that's a discussion that you should have with your healthcare provider. Great. And that, as I say, that's, that's usually for ARDA in terms of our recommendations to patients. You know, there are many sources of information and expert expertise uh, to tap, but certainly starting with your physician or um, and or those other physicians that you may be consulting um, clearly is the best path. They're going to know you the best and be able to give you that advice. Um, one question here is what happens if my biologic or biosimilar medicine stops working for me? Then you Dr. Need, K. Sure, if mm -hmm. you're no longer deriving benefit from the treatment that you're on, you should discuss this with your healthcare provider and receive an alternative treatment. It's important to recognize that a biosimilar being the same molecule as the reference product should not be substituted for the reference product if the reference product is no longer effective. So mm -hmm. receiving Remicade and your disease activity remains persistent despite treatment, switching to an infliximab biosimilar is not an appropriate alternative uh, because you'll not respond to the infliximab biosimilar because you're not responding to Remicade. The same thing goes for Rituxan and Rituximab biosimilars. Okay, thank you. Anything to add from any of our other speakers? Great. Well, thank you, Dr. K. Here's, here's, I mean, there's so many of these questions are related, but you're really bringing out fine points that I think are very important to the people that we're listening to. Um, one of our uh, people that are submitting a question by uh, our chat function, so they've taken three different biologic reference medicines before finally finding one that works. Um, my insurance company wants me to change to a biosimilar, but I'm stable. And we had a number of those questions, and I think uh, you touched on that in your um, your presentation, Dr. K, is, well, what might be the factors for you to consider if you're stable, um, you're on a particular medication uh, that, that is a, um, you know, a, a reference uh, medication, 
but there is encouragement, perhaps it's financial through your insurance plan or even your physician saying you should consider a biosimilar. Um, what is your take on that? Maybe you can uh, emphasize or reemphasize some of the points you made earlier. Sure. The, this is a switch or a transition to the biosimilar that is not being made for medical reasons. It's being made for financial reasons. The Norswich study, which was conducted in Norway, looked at nearly 500 patients who were taking Remicade and had stable disease activity. And in a blinded fashion, they were randomized to either transition to the biosimilar or to continue on the reference product. Over the course of one year, in the aggregate six diagnoses for which Remicade was indicated, there was no difference in disease worsening in the proportion of patients who experienced disease worsening between that group that transitioned to the biosimilar or that group which continued the reference product. There was no difference in anti-drug antibody development, no difference in trough drug concentrations, no difference in safety. So this study effectively demonstrated that changing from the reference product to the biosimilar does not result in worsening of disease activity any more than would be expected if you continued on the reference product. I understand that it can be unsettling to be asked to switch to a biosimilar because the insurance company considers that the reference product is expensive and would like to conserve financial resources. However, the cost of biologic aging is so high that we need to do something in order to sustain the healthcare economy so that all patients can be treated appropriately and not be restricted from receiving treatments that are necessary. We need to do something to rein in the increasing cost of healthcare. Biosimilars provide effective equivalent therapy at a lower cost and as such should be used. That's really helpful. And I just the whole issue of, of cost and then cost savings, I think in your presentation, you mentioned um, the potential then for those resources to be invested in, in further innovation um, that could lead to new biologics or then maybe the development of more biosimilars or just other treatments generally that it would could free up resources that may not otherwise be available now that could then support that innovation. And I think that kind of speaks to this um, uh, question that someone just submitted, and that is, you know, there seem to be a few biosimilars that have been approved for use, uh, but then you point out that there's more than 50 that would be in development. Um, how, you know, how fast or how, how, um, how, how should patients think about what's coming down the pike relative to those biosimilars and what might create some opportunities for them? You know, maybe, um, you know, Dr. Yim or Dr. Lacana or even Ms. Eikenberry Dr. K, just mention, you know, something about that pipeline, that pipeline for innovation and then the ability to translate that access into a biosimilar product. Um, with that number of biosimilars in development, are we going to see more options pop up? And then I'll, I'll just say that um, that question is fueled in part by all of the people who have conditions that you did not suggest currently have um, biosimilars or even biologics available to them. What about them? Is, does that pipeline hold promise, uh, both in terms of those reference drugs and that level of discovery, or then that translation to the biosimilars? And maybe um, our FDA colleagues and you, Dr. K, and probably you too, Julie, could, could take a stab at talking to us about what's ahead and how might patients so eager for, um, you know, alternatives to address their symptoms or, or perhaps even find a cure at some point. What does that innovation pipeline and that pipeline leading to biosimilar access in the marketplace uh, look like? Dr. Um, Yim, maybe you could. Yeah, so I'll start. This is Sir Yim. Um, so <clears throat> I would say that um, the biosimilar market here in the, the U.S. is at an earlier stage than the biosimilar market in Europe, for example. Um, and a lot of that is um, because of exclusivity or patent kind of concerns. Um, my hope is that we're going to continue to see an increasing number of biosimilars getting approved for um, 
additional reference products uh, because I think the more biosimilars we have, um, the more effect we're going to see overall in terms of uh, access and cost. Um, but biosimilars by themselves are, are by definition following um, behind the reference products. Um, it just depends on how long the reference product is patented or has exclusivity for. Um, so that's really what's driving uh, development in the biosimilar mm -hmm. space. Very good. And, and Dr. K or Julie, any additional thoughts to that? Sure. Let me. Go ahead. Let me. Uh, oh, thanks, Dr. K. I I think you know what's really key, especially from a uh, pharmaceutical developer perspective, is the role both generics and biosimilars play in the ecosystem of pharmaceutical development, and I think it's really important. And Dr. K um, alluded to this and talked about it a bit. Of what we saw in Europe, but what we would we will continue to see here in the U.S. is as new therapies are developed for rare diseases, for auto, autoimmune diseases, for anything, as new medicines are develop, developed, the cost of developing these new therapies is going up, this, these new innovations. And having a lower cost option through either a generic drug or a biosimilar as a lower cost option, you're lowering cost in the system in order for patients and employers and, and the country at large to be able to afford the new innovation. So I think it's a very important biosimilars play a very important part of that pipeline ecosystem uh, so that there's continued, you know, cost, lower costs, continued access to medicines, but also allowing payers and everyone to afford the new, the new medicines that are coming out. Mm -hmm. okay. Dr. K, I'm uh, sorry, I, I cut you off. <laughs> uh, the promise of biosimilar development is the development of biosimilars to other reference products that are going off patent in the future, uh, for which there are currently no biosimilars available. A major challenge to the development of new therapies for autoimmune diseases is that we have so many uh, very effective treatments for autoimmune disease, biologic agents and also small molecules, that patients are able to get effective treatment covered by insurance where they know that they're getting active drug. For a patient to be willing to participate in a placebo-controlled clinical trial of a novel agent of uncertain efficacy nowadays is rather difficult. Uh, it has become much more difficult to enroll patients with active disease in a placebo-controlled trial, and it's almost unethical to do it for any prolonged period of time. Even 12 weeks on placebo for a patient with active rheumatoid arthritis mm -hmm. is longer than ideal. Uh, so development of novel therapies is now being challenged by the availability of very effective therapies for each of these diseases. It's only a disease for which there's no currently available therapy that development of novel therapies can be carried out relatively straightforwardly. That's a really interesting point. You know, we very much encourage and actually serve as a bridge for autoimmune patients to understand, know about, and participate in clinical trials that are clearly taking place, um, in many cases, more around that novel, novel intervention or novel therapeutic um, pathway. But yet that, that clearly plays out. And so um, that was a really good, good comment. We've got some simple um, questions that came forward, but they relate to this issue of affordability and availability. Um, one question, and it may speak, I think, to each of you differently, is why do these, why do biosimilars cost less? Um, it's, a, it's a living um, process that creates the biosimilars. So I would think that's a little more expensive than just following a simple formulation that you might see in a generic uh, environment, but why do biosimilars um, cost less? And maybe you could just share that with us 
maybe Dr. Yim or Lakana or um, maybe uh, Julie might have a thought on that. Just you know, help us understand why why they are less costly. Hi, this is Sarah Yim. So, as Dr. Lakana mentioned, um, the main way that biosimilars can um, be at a lower cost is that um, they don't have to do as many clinical studies as a as a drug that hasn't been approved yet because the biosimilars are following the reference product and their um, the information from the reference product clinical development program. So the ability to um, make the pathway um, less onerous in terms of, of studies and tests is what helps to make biosimilars less expensive. There might be other reasons as well, and Ju Julie um, can probably speak to those. Thanks, Sarah, and, and that's exactly it. I think um, it is because this is a different pathway. We're not repeating phase three um, in all cases. In, in many cases, not repeating all these clinical trials and everything because we are following the biosimilar pathway and it's it's uh, based on, you know, you guys are the scientists here, but uh, I, I think you've taught me well about on the, you know, attributes and the analytics and everything else. So it's, it's a different pathway, but again, the comp, you sh everyone on the call should feel very confident that the biosimilar is as safe and as, as effective as, as its refer, uh, reference product. I do, I think it's important for folks to know, and I saw a question about the patents. It takes us as developers, and this is, is very important, it takes us six to eight years to develop a biosimilar and hundreds of millions of dollars. So it, it, it's an expensive um, undertaking, and it's, you know, it's important to understand why and how much investment goes in and time goes into bringing a, a high quality and FDA approved biosimilar to the marketplace. There was a question about patents and I think um, so, so, so folks know the patents in the, and it's important to protect intellectual property uh, but we are allowed as developers to develop a biosimilar but with the FDA's um, approval before the patents expire. There's a certain amount of time in the law that says we can't do any development, and then we're allowed to develop. And as I said, it takes six to eight years to develop a biosimilar. Um, and then when the patents expire, that's when, if the FDA has approved our, bio, our biosimilar, after the patents expire, that's when we get to bring it to the marketplace. So I just wanted to clarify um, that for everyone and, and for one of our uh, listeners who was asking that question. Thanks. That's, that's really helpful. Um, what, what about insurance? I mean, at different points, we've talked about the role of insurance. Um, are insurance plans, you know, embracing biosimilars? Is there reluctance? Does it really depend on, you know, the prescribing physician, you know, our formularies being adopted? Maybe that um, relates to what you just described, Julia, and patents and the ability of biosimilars to even, you know, be considered by insurance companies. But what are you, what are you seeing in terms of insurance companies and even some healthcare systems? I know that there are some that have really taken a close look at biosimilars. What are the behaviors you're seeing in those different environments? Are you seeing a propensity for adoption or availability? I'll tackle that question. Say, yeah, go ahead, Dr. K. Insurance companies embrace FDA-approved biosimilars as long as the cost is less than that of the reference product. Healthcare systems were slower to adopt biosimilars on the formulary uh, because of price issues and coverage, but nowadays healthcare systems tend to favor biosimilars for infused medications. At my institution, infliximab biosimilars are being used uh, if insurance company prefers that a patient receive the biosimilar, that is what is given to the patient. I write an order for infliximab, either reference or biosimilar, and whatever the insurance company prefers is what the patient receives. The same thing now for rituximab. And the discounts for the biosimilar can be quite significant. In the Veterans Administration system, 
where the Veterans Administration puts out to bid the different products, Biosimilar and Fliximab came in at an 81% discount compared to Remicade. So the VA system saves more than $500 per 100 milligram vial of, of infliximab when they give the biosimilar than the reference product. As such, the Veterans Administration has encouraged physicians to write for the biosimilar rather than the reference product. And this provides patients with equivalent care and saves the system money that can be used to take care of veterans for other problems with other medications. Mm -hmm. Treatments. And That's I would great. say, yeah, I would add to that to say we are seeing um, insurance companies put biosimilars on their formularies. Uh, do we see it if you were to compare a biosimilar marketplace to the generic marketplace? The biosimilars are continuing to struggle. Uh, the market is, there's one product that has, after six years, has only got, gotten to a 50% market share, while most, most of the biosimilars on the marketplace today are, um, you know, only about 20% uh, of the market. And this is an important um, uh, percentage to understand, especially because the biosimilars are lower cost, so we're, we're leaving cost savings on the table for both the providers, to, you know, the, the insurance companies, the employers, but especially the patients. And I think w what is important to us is to understand is, you know, some insurance companies are continuing to prefer the brand biologic. There are, and folks see this in the news every day, the the rebate system or, you know, how um, a company may be rebating an insurance and um, an insurance company or a provider can prevent access to the lower cost um, biosimilar that is also available. So from a patient perspective, looking at out-of-pocket cost, uh, the question is, and as we talked about earlier, is does your insurance company offer access to a biosimilar? If it doesn't, then the question is, is could you be saving money on these on a biosimilar? And what kind of savings could you see um, in your pocket and your out-of-pocket costs if you were offered a biosimilar? Right now, on average, the biosimilar launches at least 30%. Uh, below the reference product, and that should, again, have an impact on your out-of-pocket. So mm -hmm. I think it's important for patients and doctors to, to ask those questions. Well, Julie, that's always good advice, I think, to encourage that dialogue. And we're coming up to uh, the end of our time. I've been looking at the, the chats and comments that have been coming through, and it seems like we um, – have provided so many of the answers that people with autoimmune conditions are looking for. We will continue to provide responses and resources on the website when we post this particular program and additional resources that um, our speakers have provided that will all be available on the uh, ARDA website. Um, and I do want to thank our speakers very much. I also want to point out that, you know, this conversation that ARDA has been pleased to host, and thank you so much to the FDA colleagues, Dr. Yim, Dr. Lakana, um, Ms. Eikenberry, you, Dr. K, and of course, Julie, my good colleague at the Biosimilars Forum. Um, we, all of us together, have an opportunity, I think, to help patients understand the medications that are available to them, including biosimilars, and really put that into the context of resources and savings and reinvestment. I just, you know, would say that uh, the Lupus Foundation of America, the Arthritis Foundation, psoriasis, Healthy Women, um, these are just a few of the organizations that have been hosting these kinds of conversations about the promise of, of biologics and the potential for biosimilars. And I think collectively um, we all want to continue to support patients and um, support each of you, support the FDA, which is really our North star in um, providing confidence in those medications that are approved and we can take trusting that they're safe and that they'll promote our health and the fact that we're looking at uh, more affordable options. This is key. And uh, so I will say on behalf of Arda, thank you so much for being a part of this. 
Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to the many people that signed on. We had people from international um, locations as well as domestically across the country. Julie, as the co-sponsor on behalf of the Biosimilars Forum, I'll give you the last word as we wrap up. <laughs> well, Randy, my last word is thank you to you and to your organization for co-sponsoring this with us but also thank you to the Biosimilars Forum, the FDA, and Dr. K uh, for joining us. I just encourage everyone, th these are very strange times. We're living in a, a world changed by COVID where many of us are struggling to get uh, through work, to our doctor's appointments, access to our medicines. We need biosimilars. We need lower costs. Uh, we need more patients to have access to their medicines. This is so important. So just want to thank everybody for staying on the phone and, and for attending. And, again, if you need any questions answered or whatever, please reach out. We're, we're here to support all of you. So thank you. That's absolutely the case. Thank you all so much. Thank you to our speakers. Hundreds of people participated in this program today, and um, hundreds more I know registered will be visiting us online. So um, thank you all, and have a great afternoon. Take care. Take care.